Today we are finally, finally going to upgrade my system to AMD. And I've actually, I was just thinking about this a minute ago, I've never owned an AMD processor or even a graphics card. I've always owned Intel for CPUs, uh, Nvidia for graphics. And it's kind of because I've always built my systems around what's the best for gaming. And it's always been Intel for the processor side, Nvidia for the graphics side. And I guess you could still say that technically Intel's still the best CPUs with their higher clock speed, but we've gotten to a point that if you do anything other than just strictly gaming, you want to go with AMD. And since now I've started this whole, you know, YouTube thing, I do more than just games. So I think it's time to jump on that AMD bandwagon. And we're going to jump in with both feet with the new Ryzen 9 3950X. And we're going to compare the system after it's built around this platform to what it is today and find out how big of a jump it is. <laughs> Before we get busy tearing this all to pieces to rebuild it, we should probably talk about how the system is now because that's what we're basing all of our new numbers against. We're trying to see what kind of gains we're getting by going with AMD. So right now we're sitting at an i7 7700K at five gigahertz. RAM, we have four eight gig DIMM, so 32 gigs of RAM at 3000 megahertz, 2080 Ti, and everything is obviously water cooled. And for the new system, we are going with the pre-mentioned 3950X. We're going to stick with 16 gigs of RAM, but we're moving to two 16 gig DIMMs, and they're going to be at 36 megahertz, 3600 megahertz. And for a B CPU, we're going to need a beast motherboard. This is the X570 Aorus Master from Gigabyte, and it's one of their top tier X570 motherboards. Now there is a board that's one tier higher that comes with 10 gig ethernet, no chipset fan, and 16 phase power, but for that board, uh, the price is getting dangerously close to what you pay for just the 3950X itself. Now, although Gigabyte did send this over for this project, this is a board that I would purchase at $360 for a CPU like the 3950X. Now I realize $360 is a lot of money for a motherboard, but for that price, you're getting a motherboard that's loaded with features. One of the first features that you notice on this board is its power delivery. The board has dual eight pin ATX connectors that feed a monstrous VRM that produces direct 14 phase digital power. And with all that power comes the need for some real cooling, which is accomplished with a full fin array and direct touch heat pipes. The board has the capacity to house three Gen 4 M.2 drives, and the I.O. is plentiful with Q-Flash and CMOS clear buttons, Wi-Fi 6 antenna connectors, and the, the antenna that comes with this motherboard is a proper Wi-Fi antenna, so that's always good. And it gets better. On the board, you're going to find a power and reset switch, which is exciting in and of itself, but you also get these dip switches that are located just underneath that. On the left, you have a switch that lets you enable or disable dual BIOS. The one on the right tells the board which BIOS to boot from. So you have a primary and a backup, which is great if you do overclocking and you've done the thing that I have where you mess something up and then you, you can't get the board to boot. Well, you can just flip your switch and boot from the other BIOS. And below that, you have an all important debug display, which you don't know what you don't have until you, you lose it. So I had one on my ASRock board way back when. My ASUS board did not have one and I'm glad to have it back. Other than that, the board is packed with sensors and headers. You got seven pump or fan headers, seven internal temperature sensors, two external temperature sensors, and one noise detection header. Last but not least, I do have an M.2 that's Gen 4. So this is a one terabyte M.2 drive. So we'll put that in there. I don't know if I'll notice any speed difference between the M.2 I have now and a Gen 4 one, but I will have it because it's now compatible with Gen 4. PCIe, so now let's take everything apart to put it right back together.
tell you what. Some builds go good, some not so much. This, this one was a, a not so much build. You might notice that this video is actually coming out quite a bit later than normal. That's because getting to this point was very tough, very hard. Let me give you, I'll give you a, like a rundown of what happened. So if you're getting ready to do a, a new Ryzen build, maybe you can avoid this um, and not have to spend hours upon hours troubleshooting and trying to get your system up and running. So the first thing that happened to me, maybe my fault, maybe not. I've never really had this issue before, but when I was tearing down the original system, I had another power supply uh, nearby that I was running for some testing. And as I was taking out all the cables of my Antec power supply, they kind of got mixed in with my EVGA power supply. Didn't think anything of it. Put everything back together. And one of the power cords from my EVGA power supply supply got mixed into uh, the build plugged into my antex it was um, basically a SATA power cable from the EVGA power supply so when I hit the power button at the time didn't know this but hit it nothing happened just a click sound and I was like uh oh not good tried a bunch of things get it going um, didn't know it was a power cable problem but uh, what I ended up thinking it was is a motherboard problems because that's really all I could think of is that the system wasn't booting because the motherboard was something wrong with it. So I went out and actually bought a new one and when I got it back here and plugged in my new X570 Aorus Master, the same thing happened. So that led into more troubleshooting, swapping CPU between power supplies, swapping RAM kits between the new one I have, the original one I have in my system, and then just, I don't know, happenstance, I was plugging in the EVGA on, a, on like a test cart and I noticed that the system booted fine when I had it plugged into a different power supply. So long story short, I found out that evidently if you use a, a SATA power cable from an EVGA power supply and an Antec power supply, it doesn't like it. I, to, who was to know? I've never had multiple power supplies when I've done a build in the past. This is the first time I've had different power supplies sitting around. And what? I don't understand why a SATA cable on one power supply won't work on the other, but I don't know. Do you ever plug in everything and hit power and you just hear a click and nothing happens except for like, the RAM lit up. That was about it. Check to make sure that you don't have a stray cable from a different power supply in there. After solving that problem, we were able to get the system to boot. So everything booted up, but then I noticed that this kit of RAM uh, was only showing 16 gigs or one stick. So I was like, well, that's a bummer. Is something wrong with the, the socket or the board again? Uh, since I already had the other motherboard, that kind of helps. So I swapped CPUs, you know, I swapped the CPU into the other motherboard, tried it. Same problem. Couldn't get one of the sticks to work. So it was kind of obvious that I had a stick, a problem with one of these DIMMs, one of the, one of the RAM sticks. Luckily, I had my old, you know, Trident Z from my previous build, slower RAM speed, uh, 3000 versus uh, 3600. They're 8 gig DIMMs rather than 16, but either way, Luckily I had them, so I was able to plug all those in, boot it up, all the RAM detected. We're looking good, right, right, wrong. So everything seemed to be working fine. I ran my benchmarks, the gaming. I noticed the gaming scores were lower than previously, and I kind of expected that because the Intel system, five gigahertz base or base clock, um, basically all core clock, and this 3950X has a stated of up to 4.7 on one core. From what I've seen, it's about 4.2. I did see a boost to 4.6 for a split second, but so I expected to be slower gameplay. So yeah, that seemed all right. But then I noticed that every now and then the whole system would just lock up. And I was like, what is this? Because I had the latest BIOS. I had checked everything else during this other shenanigans, all these other things that went wrong. So I was kind of stuck. I didn't know exactly what was going on at the time. And well, long story short, I did find out that AMD has released, basically, it's not a BIOS update, it's a chipset driver update. Never seen this anywhere, I haven't really even heard of any other tech channels talking about it, but either way, after some research, I found that you should probably check your chipset drivers. So I did. I went on the AMD's website, downloaded the new chipset drivers for XY70, downloaded them, and what do you know, everything works great. Finally. Now... Yes, the RAM is a little slower than intended, so when I do upgrade the RAM, we might see a slight boost in speed, but I like how it looks. It runs great now. 
and we can actually look at all the test benches and understand what kind of performance gain we finally got now that we're done battling it. So the first thing we'll talk about are Cinebench. It's kind of for the memes. We, we know that 3950X is going to be a lot better than a 7700K, even if the 7700K is run at 5 gigahertz. But in Cinebench, 7700K got a score of 2379. The 3950X, I saw a score of 9259. So it's a lot better. But we, we expected that. 8 threads versus 32. 3D Mark Time Spy, we had a total score on the 7700K of 11,375, a graphic score of 13,765, and a CPU score of 5704. The same run, Time Spy 3D Mark for the 3950X, same 2080 Ti, obviously between the two, and actually the same RAM kit. We saw a total score or a system score of 13,385, a graphic score pretty much the same, 13,440 and a CPU score this time around of 13,082. So that is a giant leap in the CPU score. I've actually, all the times I've ran that, that benchmark, it always gets to the CPU test and it starts chugging. This time around it is done. I was like, woo. And then like I said, gaming was looking a bit down, but after I got the chipset all figured out, uh, I ran all the tests again. And the only reason I actually thought about looking at the chipset is I got into DCS and DCS literally ran like potatoes. So I knew something was actually wrong. But anyway, after getting the chipset all updated, the graphic scores, or the, the game scores, were pretty much on par with only DCS seeing a slight dip uh, in quality. Everything else was pretty much the same or slightly better. But all that aside, it doesn't really matter because when we come back to it, the reason I wanted such a high core count, high thread count CPU was because of the potential workload or the work savings when it comes to rendering videos. So I took that same 4 minute and 39 second clip uh, on DaVinci Resolve 16 and when I rendered it out on the 7700K, it took a whopping 10 minutes, 49 seconds for just that 4 minute and 39 second clip. When I did that same clip, on this on the 3950x we got a total time to render of one minute 51 seconds which is amazing we went from 10 minutes to basically two minutes and it doesn't sound like a lot but as the clips get longer or the the you know the render you know say it was a 10 minute video we're talking about tons and tons of time saved which if you're creating content on youtube is awesome so having a chip this powerful is Literally a game changer when it comes to being able to content create uh, on a small scale like myself. And then also having the horsepower to play some gaming at some high levels, some good FPSs. And although getting here was laborsome to say the least, when it's all said and done, it was worth it. And if you're looking to upgrade to AMD, other than make sure you do all the little things that I, I did wrong, correct the first time around, you're going to have a good time. So thank you guys for watching. Sorry this video came out a little later than possible. We'll see you next time.